Chapter 16, Queuing Theory and Modeling. This is the 16th chapter in the Handbook of Healthcare Delivery Systems, and this will be a summary of the original chapter by Linda Green from Columbia University. This is a great read, and in particular, the big takeaway is that you can't properly assess bed capacity based on occupancy levels, because as the occupancy level or the utilization increases, the queue grows exponentially. And in general, it seems that when utilization gets over 85%, it starts to lead to exponential delays and wait length increase. Queuing theory was first really fleshed out by Erlang in 1904, who was working on the Danish telephone system. And it looks at why there are delays. And a delay is essentially an occurrence when the demand for a service and the capacity available to meet that demand are mismatched. One of the benefits of modeling queuing theory is that it perhaps only needs three variables, and this is much fewer than required for the other healthcare modeling we looked at in past chapters that was much more intensive. The first models we're going to look at today assume a steady state, meaning that the model could be looked at at any time and you'd get the same response. And the very last model, which is uh, time varying demands, you'll see that the state changes throughout the day. A few queuing theory fundamentals. In queuing theory, you have customers and servers. The customer is the side waiting and it can be an actual customer or it could be a widget or a patient waiting for a bed. On the server side, you have those providing the service, which could be an actual human or an MRI machine, or a CT machine, or a phlebotomist. The queue can be either visible, the actual line of people waiting, or it could be invisible, such as uh, those waiting online for a uh, telephone queue. When you have a queue, it can either have an infinite waiting room, meaning that essentially unlimited number of people can wait, or you can have a capped waiting room, in that once you exceed the number of people who can wait in line, those or others are turned away. The queue can be processed as a single line, which is generally preferred, or with each server having their own queue in parallel. But as we'll see, this often can create uh, longer wait lists. The queue can be processed first come, first serve, FCFS, based on, pr or it can be process based on priority. And when you're processing a queue based on priority, it can either be preemptive or non-preemptive. Preemptive means that if a customer with a higher priority comes in to the queue, that they will bump out a lower priority customer if they're already being served. And the non-preemptive priority queue means that if a higher priori priority customer walks in, they have to wait until the next server is free. Let's move on to utilization, delays, and system size. Utilization is simply the average number of busy servers divided by the total number of servers times 100. <clears throat> Two really important takeaways on general utilization principles. And the first is on this graph right here, if you're looking in the video or on the blog. As the hot utilization increases, the average delay or the wait list increases. And it is important to realize that as utilization increases, the queue grows faster, meaning that the relationship between utilization and delay is not linear, but in fact exponential. As you can see here, there is a kick to the curve, or an elbow, where at a certain utilization, the rate of increase of the queue length dramatically increases. The exact place at what utilization, the curve will experience this kick and that the delay will start to rise exponentially can vary based on two factors. The first is variability. In systems that have less variability, you can ha experience a higher utilization before you experience the exponential 
length in cubed. The second variable is the total system size. If you have a system with, uh, for instance, more beds available, you can use those beds at a higher utilization before you experience this kick of the curve. Therefore, you could imagine the worst possible scenario being one where you have a smaller system size and you also have very high variability. This means that you would be prone in the system to experiencing exponential increases in your queue length earlier on than if you had a very large system with low variability. The book discusses some simple queuing models. It looks at the idea of a Poisson process, which is used for many healthcare processes where patients arrive one at a time at random intervals, and that their arrival is not dependent on other customers or on external events. And then using this Poisson process, you can develop an M slash M slash S model, and that relies on the Poisson process an unlimited waiting room, identical servers, and a single queue. And in this model, you can essentially set your desired service level, meaning that if you want 85% of calls answered within 20 seconds. You can also uh, extend the model to uh, work for priorities, meaning that you could calculate 90% of emergent and urgent patients being seen by physicians within 45 minutes, or you could extend the model to place a cap on the queue length. It's interesting uh, that in healthcare in America, in order to apply apparently for something which is called a certificate of need in order to expand the number of beds in your hospital, you need to have an average occupancy level of at least 85%. And in the prior chapters, one of them discussed that in factories, factory owners look to expand their infrastructure when they start to reach around, I believe, 85% capacity. And uh, we'll see exactly why that is important right now as we move to the section on fixed capacity queues. Now, in a fixed capacity queue, you could imagine, um, for instance, that being a CT scanner or an MRI machine or the number of beds in an ICU. The server is actually, in these cases, typically an object. And it's important to realize that the type of modeling we're doing here is not uh, scheduling appointments. For instance, if you had a CT machine and you were scheduling in slots to use that machine, in theory, you won't have overlap in your schedules and a queue will not develop. This fixed capacity queue modeling would apply if, for instance, you had extra time in the MRI machine schedule that you were trying to fill with the random uh, walk-ins of new patients. The chapter goes through an example from an obstetrics unit, and in this case, what we can see is the effect of increasing or reducing the number of beds on the probability that a patient will wait or experience a delay in trying to get for a bed. And the authors in the chapter took baseline data from an obstetrics unit with an average arrival rate of 14.8 patients per day, an average length of stay of 2.9 days, and an existing 56-bed unit. Or I think I might have misread I think it was 59 bed. If you look on the table in the blog or on the video, you will see that at a f number of 59 beds in the unit, the probability of a delay is 1.3%, and the utilization is 73%. Apparently, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology suggests a maximum occupancy or utilization of 75% on an obstetrics unit. If we look, we will see that in this particular model, approximately 75% occupancy corresponds to a probability of delay between 1.8 and 2.6%, meaning that as women uh, need to get on a bed on the obstetrics unit, there is generally, you know, 98 to 99% of the time not a delay. You can see that if we were to move to 80% occupancy or utilization, 
that now you have a 10% chance of delay, and that's around 52 beds. And if we move to 86% utilization, you have a 20% chance. When you move to 90% utilization, you're around a 40% chance. And this model, uh, at 93% utilization, you're at a 0.5%, so you're at a 50% chance. And at 95% utilization, there is a 67% chance of delay. And so as you can see in this model, the utilization between 66% and um, you know 75% generally incurs very low delays, but then you start to experience a very quick doubling, an exponential kick of the curve as you get into utilizations in the high 70s and 80s, which explains perhaps why the College of Obstetrics and Gynecology suggests the max occupancy of 75%. I want to show you the, uh, two other charts from the same model that they looked at. The first is on how the, changing the arrivals per day can dramatically affect your probability of delay. And you can see here, moving from an existing model of 13.9 uh, arrivals per day to uh, 14.8, which is what their model had, if you just add you know, an extra two patients, your probability of delay almost doubles, right? You move from being at 1%, at 10% uh, to 30%. And if you were to increase it by another two patients arriving per day, you can easily jump up to a 70% chance of delay. Meaning that, again, we don't want to probably run the operation at 100% utilization because that means almost with 100% certainty that there'll be delay in getting that resource. Uh, here's another uh, way which you can look at this problem. In this case, they have three different lines, each representing different probability of delay, 10%, 5%, and 1%. And they show you on a graph how if you desired a 1% probability of delay, and you wished to run your unit at, let's say, 70% occupancy, this would require that there was a total of roughly 65 beds. But if you were okay running the same unit at 5%, uh, with, a prob sorry, with a probability of delay at 5%, but again, still at 70% occupancy, in this case, you could shift to the, up to the second line, which shows approximately the need for only 40 to 45 beds. And if you're okay with a 10% probability of delay, you can shift up to the third line, which has marks and intersects at around 25 beds. And again, each different scenario will change how, what your acceptable probability of delay is. Can the patients wait elsewhere? Is it life-threatening that they receive a bed? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now, it's important to realize that one of the big solutions to these types of problems is something called you know, a flexible bed model or swing beds. And the example would be that if you had a unit where in one season the beds could be used for flu, such as when you have an increased number of admissions uh, during that period, if there was a counter-cyclical season where those beds could be used perhaps for ATV rollovers. Then in the summer, the ATV rollovers and uh, you know orthopedic surgery trauma could use the, that ward. And in the other season, the swine flu patients could, or just the flu patients. Um, one way to very concretely think about this is on a medicine department, you could have 100 flexible beds, meaning that all subspecialties can admit to this uh, pool of 100. This is the opposite of having 10 separate units of individual subspecialty departments. The problem is that if you were to run a ward of 10 subspecialty beds at 70% capacity, meaning that seven of them were filled, because your total number of beds is much smaller, as we discussed in the previous chapters, you're going to incur the kick of the curve when you get an exponential Q growing 
much sooner than if you actually had all 100 beds together and then you ran those at 70% capacity. It's still the same number of beds being filled, but your ability to absorb a Q length is dramatically different. Very last part is to discuss the fact that patients uh, don't always arrive in the exact same uh, independent manner. And a typical example is the emergency room where less patients arrive overnight and more patients arrive in the morning and throughout the day. This can be plotted as seen on the graph in the uh, do document. And the way which you can calculate your Q length if you want to adapt for this variation in day is you can subdivide the day into uh, groupings of either two hour periods or four hour periods or six or eight. It doesn't matter. In this particular example, the authors uh, subdivided it into periods of two hours and they calculated for each period of two hours using the MMS model um, and the assumption that no patient sorry, that no more than 20% of patients should wait for more than one hour before being seen by a provider, exactly how many physicians were required throughout the evening, morning, and daytime shifts. And by uh, this example that they did in the book, they pulled some of the physicians which were working overnight to working into the early morning shifts to uh, meet these queuing models. There we have it. Uh, again, this chapter is available if you want. You can uh, loan the book actually online, Handbook of Healthcare Delivery Systems. And uh, I'll certainly be finding in the future some other books on queuing theory.